Okay, let's talk about the level one results that came out yesterday. We have a 44% pass rate. Look at the bottom of the screen here in red. 25,000 people sat for the exam. That's, that's quite a bit for an August exam, actually. 44% pass rate, so 11,000. I'm not looking to round off any numbers here. I'm just taking their numbers. 11,000 uh, should be moving to level two at some point. And 14,000 uh, will be repeating level one or leaving. It is quite common at level one that uh, some that don't make it just decide, oh, well, that's, that's it for me. You have a huge cohort that enters level one every year. But the amount that actually gets on to level two and level three nowhere uh, represents the amount of people at level one. So we know a lot of people just walk away from this. And um, if you're going to walk away, it, it does, I think, um, sort of beg you to, for a moment, reflect on why it is that you're walking away. And if it's for the right reasons, then walk away. But if it's because you had a bad experience, that's not always a reason to walk away. I want you to think about uh, university. I, I know I've had uh, this experience where <clears throat> you decide that you're going to take a class. You read the description of the class and you say, this, is, this sounds really great, and you take it. And your experience during the semester is so bad, you never take anything in that subject field again, whether it was the professor, whether it was the textbook that was chosen. Uh, whatever the case is, you just never go back. I know I've taken some courses that may have been interesting except for the professor, and I have taken some courses that I thought, oh, I got to take this course, I'm not going to enjoy it, but the professor really brought it to life, really energized it. So, you know, if you're walking away from level one, is your experience because you say, oh, I didn't enjoy any of that? Let's figure out why you didn't enjoy it. So um, I just want to read uh, this from CFAI, actually. It was in a different uh, um, news story, but it quotes CFAI here. The Institute also broke down the difference between those who took the exam for the first time versus those who took it after delaying their exam. First-time testers scored significantly above the average pass rate at 50%. Uh, while those with at least one deferral <clears throat> had an average pass rate of 29%. Uh, and here is a quote uh, from Chris Weesey. Our exam results analysis consistently shows the significant statistical impact of deferring an exam, um, encouraging candidates to stick to a schedule and maintain their study habits. And I, I, I think that requires a little bit of, of breaking down for a moment. Uh, and a good analogy is insurance companies. <clears throat> How does an insurance company know whether you're a good driver or a bad driver? If you're a good driver, you'll get lower rates. If you're a bad driver, you'll get higher rates. But if you ask everybody, are you a good driver? Oh, yeah, I'm a good driver. I'm a good driver. Um, <clears throat> so it's hard to tell. So they use the deductible as a way for you to reveal your preferences. That if you opt for a very low deductible, a $100 deductible, the insurance company says, ah, okay, you're a bad driver. But if you say, ah, I'll take a $2,000 deductible, I'm fine. Uh, the insurance company says, whoa, you're pretty confident. You must be a good driver. So the higher your deductible, the lower your insurance rate, uh, not because you're willing to pay for it, but because you think that you won't pay for it. So there's a nice analogy. Keep that in mind, and let's look at these people uh, who defer. It is not the act of deferring uh, that then sentences you to a lower pass rate, where you say, well, if I, if I don't defer, I got a 50% chance of passing. If I do defer, I only have a 29% chance of passing. That's not what this is saying. It is saying that those students those candidates that do opt to defer are taking the path of least resistance, that they're less willing to put in the time necessary to make it for this exam, and they defer to the next exam. There is nothing about their behavior that says it'll change. Uh, when I was a professor, uh, one institution I was at had a very liberal sick policy. 
and I'll put it in quotes, that you all you had to do was say, I am sick, and we had to believe them. Very liberal sick policy. My A students were never sick. They were never sick. A and B students, never sick. The C and the D students, they, they were sick a lot. Uh, and they weren't sick, they just were unprepared. Uh, you would think that with an extra week to write the makeup exam that they would do better. Nope, nope, they didn't do any better because there's nothing about their behavior that says if you give them more time, they will change their behavior. And I think that's what you're seeing in the 29% on average, on average now, because life happens and sometimes you have to defer, but on average, when we talk about samples and we have to talk, you know, on average, on average, those that defer didn't put in the appropriate amount of time, weren't prepared, had the opportunity to defer, took that opportunity, but never changed their behavior so that when it got time to write again, they still weren't prepared. A 44% pass rate is in line with historical norms that if there was no option to defer, you'd still have the same pass rate because this group would still be in there, they'd still have that pass rate, except you couldn't identify them because nobody had deferred. You couldn't identify those people who were unwilling to put in the time, or unwilling, uh, 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 sorry, yeah, the way I did say that, unwilling to put in the time. But because now they can defer, you can identify who they are in the sample. That's all. So if you did not pass, if you passed, uh, you're going to be doing May 2025 for level two. If you did not pass, I see no reason uh, why you wouldn't do February 2025. But let's ask why before you decide, oh, this is not for me anymore. Uh, or, okay, I'll just sign up again. Let's ask why you did not pass. The biggest reason is you did not put in the time. That's why people defer. I'm not prepared. I didn't put in the time. You didn't put in the appropriate amount of time. That is the biggest reason. Um, those who did not defer, 50% did not pass. Those that did defer, 71% did not pass. I'm pretty sure for the 71, this is, this is the reason. For the 50%, <clears throat> I'm sure if you really think about it, uh, you'll probably say that that was, that was probably a big part of it. Because uh, you can ask yourself this question. If you were given one more month before the exam, if you had the opportunity to say, well, can I just get one more month? Would that have made a difference? And if you say, yes, it would have made a difference, well, then you didn't put in uh, the right amount of time. Uh, you might also say, but I did put in the time, uh, to which I would then say, well, was it quality time? You know, having the videos playing, uh, while you have a chat window open and you're busy chatting with two or three other people and you got music playing in the background, that's not quality time. That's not putting in the time. That is having time pass and convincing yourself that you put the time in. But you didn't. That's not quality time, right? Did you go it alone? Sometimes we uh, think we understand something, but when uh, asked to, uh, you know, verbalize what you know about this and you listen you say well, okay no no you have a misunderstanding of that but you firmly believe you've got it so you may believe that you knew something but you knew it wrong as mark twain said it's not the things we don't know that will hurt us uh, the most it's the things we know for sure that just ain't so so if you uh, went it alone was there anybody uh, with you to check whether or not your understanding was correct or you had uh, the wrong understanding. This is another big one that we really have to think about. Did you enjoy it? And did you enjoy it? If you didn't enjoy it along the way and you say, well, this is not for me, then why do it? You know, why, why register again? If, if it's not for you, it's okay to leave it. I've left some things in the past that I've started and I say, you know what, I, I'm not enjoying this. This is not for me. Well, then leave it. Because if you don't enjoy it, you'll never really be good at it. <clears throat> and it's hard to find the motivation to put in the time for something you just don't enjoy. Are you excited to be learning this stuff? Right? Is this something you want to do or is this something you need to do? And there's an intersection set. It's maybe you have a job and 
Uh, this is a requirement. It's like, well, listen, you really need to be on the, on the CFA path. And you say, yeah, but I want to do that anyways. Mm -hmm. It's when uh, you have to, this need to do it, but you don't really want to do it. Here, um, if you need to do it, you're going to have to find a way to make it a want. You're going to have to fall in love with it somehow. You're going to have to get addicted to this stuff somehow. Textbooks can be dry and boring. Uh, and much like I said earlier with some classes, professors can kill it for you. So you, you have to sort of, you know, uh, debrief yourself on saying, well, exactly what is the issue here? Is it me or was it something along the process that turned me off to this whole thing? Is it too theoretical? Is it too dry? Is it too boring? Is it, am I inherently uninterested in it? Or maybe I am interested in it. It just, the content didn't bring out that interest in me. It could be something like that. You're going to have to find a way to make it a want. When you want to do it, that is self-motivating on its own. So is this something that you need to do? If the answer is no. Is this something you want to do? And if you want to do it, well, why do you want to do it? Do you want to do it because you really love this stuff? Or do you want to do it because you think it's just going to look good on a resume, but you're not really in love with it? Then why are you looking for a job in a field in which you're not in love with, right? So take some time. Ask why. And don't stop asking why till you get to the root of it. You know, uh, why did I fail? I didn't put in the appropriate amount of time. Well, why didn't you put in the appropriate amount of time? Well, I'm not really that interested in it. It's kind of boring. Well, why are you not really that interested in it? Uh, you know, I, finance has just never been my thing, but, you know, for my job, I have to do it. Okay, well, then you're going to have to find a way to resolve that conflict. If you have to do it for your job, but you're really not that into it, you got to resolve it somehow. Get in the game. You know, sometimes watching golf, when I was a kid watching golf, really boring. But if you are actually a, uh, a player, if you actually do play golf, you can watch the game. It's not that boring. I still think watching golf is boring because I don't play golf. Uh, but I've been involved in other sports and I watch them and I think, okay, well, I don't mind watching this because I've been in the game. So get into the game. Uh, you can open up paper portfolios. You can start to trade. Nothing is more addicting than success. You start getting some early winners. You get drawn in. Then you want to know why. You want to know how to improve your probability of success. Well, for that, you need a good foundation in education. There's level one. Well, how much is this stock really worth? I mean, I don't know. Is it worth? Is it undervalued? Is it over? There's level two. That's a whole valuation level. Well, should I just buy one stock? Should I buy two? Should I buy an ETF? How, how do you put together a portfolio of these? Well, there's level three, portfolio management and construction, right? Get addicted to this stuff. But don't just walk away. Don't walk away without first debriefing yourself and ask why till you get to the root cause. And if the root cause is, I don't want to do this. I don't enjoy it and I don't like it and I don't want to do it. Then walk away. Okay, that, uh, that's it. All right, now that that message is over, let me uh, throw in a pitch for the applied level. If you are uh, moving uh, to level two and you don't have the applied level, just select uh, level two plus, the level two plus option. Uh, if you are new to us at level one, if you did not pass and you want to try something new, uh, you can add uh, level one CFA plus. You don't have to, but the CFA plus has the applied level within it. A lot of really neat stuff in there. Some things that are relevant to you, uh, the one we're working on and getting completed uh, in the fall term here is um, financial modeling using a real world example, Costco. And as you go through uh, the example, I don't give you any spreadsheet at all, we start from a blank workbook and we do line by line, we add it. So you'll build something uh, that looks like what you see on the screen. And once you're done, once you've uh, completed the whole spreadsheet, since I'm not giving it to you, you have to complete it, email it to me and you get a certificate of completion. Um, if you want a free preview of what this looks like, I've uh, taken three of the introductory videos for this and I put it uh, behind this link. 
Uh, this link is in the description box. Just click on that and you can get a, a, a free preview of what the Excel modeling course looks like. Uh, and we are using a real world example. No manufactured data here. We're using Costco. So this financial model is not just uh, an Excel model uh, that a, a, a modeler would do once given the assumptions. This is an analyst to model. In other words, you're going to do the analyst part of it in coming up with the assumptions and then the modeling part to create the model itself. For the applied level, if you're wondering, well, what is the applied level? What's in the applied level? Here is a link here to a PDF. This link is also in the description box and it will tell you uh, everything that's in the applied level. Key points to keep in mind here, there is no expiration. So if you uh, take uh, the CFA level one uh, plus, when you move on to level two, you don't have to take the plus, you'll, you'll always have the applied level. You only have to uh, add it once. Uh, add it once. New content is continuously added. So uh, for example, for the um, uh, financial modeling, every week we add one more module. Uh, we've got the cost schedule, the working capital schedule, the fixed asset schedule, we'll do the debt schedule, the equity schedule. Uh, each week we add one more schedule till we're done. Um, by the end of October, uh, I will have a video up for understanding cybersecurity and then another video up we're going to use Palo Alto uh, Network Systems as our exemplar. It is the largest of the cybersecurity firms and it is the most prolific in terms of acquisition. And in that industry, that's the key, uh, is, is you want a firm that's got significant enough cash flow and market clout to be able to acquire a lot of the smaller firms and consolidate the industry. So we're gonna be using Palo Alto uh, as our exemplar there. So go ahead, click on the uh, first link in the description box. It'll give you a free preview of what the uh, modeling course was. If you've never done any financial modeling with real world data, this is a great way to add it on while you're getting your CFA done. The second link in the description box will lead you to a PDF which will describe all of the uh, modules and uh, what you can expect to see in each of the modules. Uh, and that's it. When I say, uh, one more thing, when I say no expiration, that means even after you're done uh, the CFA uh, courses, level one, level two, level three, three, four years later, you still will have access to the applied level. And again, new content is added all the time. The applied level is also a way uh, to bring the CFA content closer to the real world so that you can see exactly how it applies in the real world. And this might help you get addicted when you start to see, oh, that's how I can use this and that's how I can use that. Applied options are a fantastic way to begin to see how you can use the options to take different positions. Portfolio construction uh, goes through a whole bunch of different trade setups. So you can think of the applied level as sort of a continuation of what you uh, learn in the CFA space that brings you closer to the real world. And if you notice our uh, logo, uh, the A, uh, just watch this for a second here. Uh, let's just get rid of that little leg. Uh-oh, what do we see here? 